this is Breakthroughs, a podcast from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm Erin Spain, editor of the Breakthroughs newsletter. There are dozens of projects taking place here at Northwestern that involve small electronic devices that can bend, stretch, twist, and integrate on and within the human body to both diagnose and treat disease. The devices are created by John Rogers, a pioneer in the field of bioelectronics. His primary appointment is in the McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, and he has an additional appointment here at Feinberg in neurological surgery. Thanks for joining me today, John. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. If someone just Googles your name and they look under images, they're going to see some of these devices you've created because they've made some headlines. And you have a few of them in front of me here. Um, They're tiny, small patches and temporary tattoos and little tiny um, pieces, devices that sit on top of fingernails. Tell me about these devices in front of me. What are they made out of? What do they do? Yeah, so it's kind of a whole collection of uh, devices here, you know, designed for various different kinds of purposes. All of them integrate with the body in ways that uh, are novel compared to what's possible, let's say, with a a conventional wearable uh, device. A Fitbit or an Apple Watch. Yeah, I mean, those those are great pieces of gadgetry. I mean, uh, you think about, though, the the precision of the measurement and and the way that they integrate with the body. It's really fundamentally limiting in terms of, um, you know, the kinds of physiological signals that they can detect and sense, you know, in a meaningful way. And so, you know, an Apple Watch or a Fitbit, it's it's an interesting uh, device, and I think it has an important role to play in sort of fitness and wellness. But when it comes to clinical grade measurements of um, data streams that physicians know how to interpret and analyze and build di- uh, diagnosis uh, around, uh, they they really fall short. And and uh, my uh, opinion and my belief, and I think this is shared by uh, a lot of folks at this point, is that um, the lack of an intimate interface to the skin is is what really prevents those classes of devices um, you know from measuring things that uh, you know are are commonly quantified you know in a clinical or a laboratory setting because the electronics modules in those kinds of wearables are basically rigid planar blocks mm-hmm. of electronics and and it's great for a lot of things but it rattles around in, in a loosely coupled fashion you know to the wrist or sometimes the uh, the chest and the absence of that inter, uh, intimate inter, uh, interface really allows you to make measurements of things like steps or activity level, a rough approximation of of heart rate, but it can't allow you to capture electrocardiograms, for example. It doesn't allow you to measure, um, do arterial tonometry. You can't measure the time dependence of pulsatile blood flow through near surface arteries. You can't measure uh, electroencephalograms. You you can't, um, you know, precisely quantify the uh, hydration level of the skin or, you know, the thermal character. There's a whole set of things that are done routinely in the clinic that cannot be reproduced with that type of technology platform. And so one theme around the kinds of devices that that we've been developing is around new electronic materials, new designs in electronic systems and associated biosensors that allow us to build technologies that are naturally compatible with the skin itself. The kind of um, vision that we've had in this area and and sort of the, the guiding you know theme around what we're trying to do is to try to reproduce electronic function in a platform that's reminiscent of a children's temporary tattoo because we feel that 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 kind of technology represents the optimal way to integrate devices with with the skin in a way that's essentially imperceptible because the technologies adopt the physical characteristics of the skin itself and which provide that continuous intimate interface to the skin such that you can use the skin itself as a window into making all of these sort of clinical grade uh, uh, measurements of of health status. And so we have a a variety of different platforms that all share that common um, physical uh, set of uh, characteristics. Uh, They're either electronic in their functionality. We have devices now that are microfluidic in their operation, so we can capture sweat. We can do real-time biomarker analysis of sweat. We have devices that can measure ambient conditions, pollution levels, UV exposure levels, and so on. And so it's it's been a um, you know a very productive uh, direction for us. It's a platform and, 
and we take it in different directions. Typically, um, you know, identifying unmet clinical needs in close collaboration with with folks uh, at, at Feinberg, and and that's been a powerful uh, way for us to move forward. I know a lot of these devices actually hook up to apps that you can use on your phone. Yeah, so that that's another interesting aspect of this. We're not software engineers, but we have um, you know come to appreciate the value of the software component because that's the the interface that that people are are you know interacting with these devices through the devices themselves. They don't have switches or displays or anything else. Everything is happening in a virtual mode through through an app, typically running on a tablet or a or a smartphone. So, so we've developed internal, you know, software expertise in my group. I mean, I had to hire a software engineer to do this sort of stuff and uh, we've gotten pretty good at it. And, and I think one thing that, uh, again, is important is working directly with the patients, uh, with the physicians to understand what kind of interface is most valuable, what kind of information is superfluous, what kind of information is critical, how should that pre- be presented to, to the individual. It's all super important stuff. And, um, you know, being embedded in that kind of medical community with the patients and the doctors and us as engineers really allow us to to do things pretty quickly. Babies in the NICU who are covered in wires. This is another example of how you're using the technology to be less invasive, especially with these very fragile patients. That project, um, you're doing some trials right now. Yeah, that's right. So we have a great set of uh, collaborators in uh, neo- neonatology and pediatrics, Aaron Hamvas, Debbie Weismeyer, Weismeyer and um, folks in dermatology as well, Amy Poller and, and Steve Shu uh, and others. And so uh, if you go into a neonatal intensive care unit, you'll see, you know, um, really a rat's nest of uh, wires and taped on sensors that are being used to monitor vital signs in, um, you know, these premature babies whose health status is very fragile. You have to do that kind of monitoring 24-7 to keep track of, of their, their health state. And so uh, it's a problem because um, the wires themselves can impart forces at the interface between the sensors and the skin. And so the tapes that are needed to keep the sensors adhered and uh, coupled to the skin uh, have you know, adhesion strength that's sim- sometimes problematic because repeated application and removal mm-hmm. of those tapes can damage the, the fragile skin, skin of the yeah. neonate. The presence of the wires also uh, makes it extremely complicated to even do the most basic manipulation of the baby. You want to turn it over or move it. You want to take it out of the isolate. The mothers want to hold the baby. You got to take all the wires off, put them back on. It's, it's a problem. And then once the wires are there, it really prevents the natural motion of the baby because their muscles are not very, very well developed. You got all these mass and sort of physical constraints associated with the wires. It's, it's clearly uh, a non-ideal situation. And so we decided, and this this was, uh, you know, a clinical need that even we understood, you know, before, you know, kind of com- coming here to Northwestern. So about five years ago, we decided if we could make these skin-like tattoo-based electronic sensor systems work, the first thing that we would want to do is get rid of all the hardwired monitoring um, technology that's currently used in the NICU. So, so we've been working on that problem for, for probably four or five years. Over the last year or so, we've you know, been able to engage with all the uh, experts at, at Lurie Children's and dermatology, neonatology, and so on. And we have IRB approval. We're in the NICU on a regular basis these days, probably doing two babies a week, validating the technology, comparing the data streams that we can capture against those that are being recorded with with kind of the old technology approach. And it looks very, very promising. I mean, a- everything uh, works extremely well. I think the parents are happy. You know, I would the, say to be able to hold your child without having all the wires in the way has to be pretty gratifying for them and for you. Uh, yeah, it's it's interesting because, you know, you have to consent the parents. They have to understand, you know, what you're proposing to, you know, evaluate on their baby, right? So so you have these conversations and um, most of the parents of uh, premature babies are pretty stressed out. I mean, it's a yes. very stressful situation. And in spite of that, we have had about... Uh, 90 percent um, um, compliance with with our request to to do these evaluations because I think even though there's no direct benefit for these parents they see the value right in in what what we're doing and so they're enthusiastic about helping in in the development of the technology so it's it's a very satisfying uh, area to, to work in and I think it really leverages to the maximum extent this kind of skin-like 
physical form in, in, in the devices. So one really exciting project you're working on with uh, members of our physical medicine and rehabilitation department, and those are also physicians at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab, is um, a collaboration where you're working with stroke patients. And you've created one of your devices is an actual throat patch in this case. Can you tell me about that? Addressing, you know, challenges around rehabilitation for patients who've suffered from a stroke turns out to, you know, have a good alignment with the kind of unique uh, features that we have in, in, in our device platform. So we're actually deploying three separate systems on stroke patients today. You referred to uh, one type of device that uh, we've designed to integrate with the, uh, with the throat. It actually mounts on a very special part of the body known as the suprasternal notch. It's sort of a soft tissue region just above the collarbone. And um, that location was identified to us as important for stroke patients because uh, a device placed at that uh, position can be used to monitor the mechanoacoustic characteristics of speech and swallowing. And those are two sort of natural, you know, body functions that kind of break down, you know, in, in many patients who've suffered from a stroke. The ability to speak in a regular uh, manner with a regular cadence, the regular frequency is impaired uh, as a result, result of the stroke. It's known as a Aphasia. And the way that uh, the physical rehabilitation experts at the Ability Lab in the past have sort of monitored talk time is with a microphone, typically on a, uh, on a smartphone, for example, which in principle it works, but you can imagine the uh, kind of confounding signals that, that become problematic just associated with the ambient noise right. or associated with the voice of a person that you might be having uh, a conversation with. So it became difficult in, in a practical way to monitor uh, talk time using that kind of approach. But for these devices, and because they're so soft, you can mount them on the neck without any kind of uh, discomfort. We can actually measure the physical vibrational signatures of speech uh, because you're right there near the vo vocal cords. And so you become completely immune to ambient noise because you're not measuring sound waves, you're measuring physical vibrations. And so with extremely high precision and extremely high robustness, we can measure talk time, we can measure talk cadence, we can measure patterns of speech continuously through the day. And with the same device, we can measure frequency of swallowing uh, because swallowing becomes uh, impaired uh, as well. And that's known as dysphagia. And I didn't know anything about aphasia or dysphagia. You're learning so you much know, from our great. faculty you know, it's over absolutely here. Absolutely yes. fantastic. And uh, you know, I think the the fact that our devices have this skin-like characteristic allow you to contemplate, you know, a mounting position such as the suprasternal notch. I mean, you couldn't like strap a Fitbit to your neck. It's just not not gonna work, right? But but these new kinds of platforms, the new materials that we're using really open up all sorts of possibilities that nobody's really thought well, about before. And it's really that teaming relationship, mm -hmm. that intimate collaboration that makes all this stuff work. And talk about personalized medicine for these individuals. You're able to gather so much data on them that didn't. there's no way that could have been gathered before. Right. And so that that's the whole point is that I think the um, model going forward, and this is something that, um, you know, the, the folks at the Ability Lab really, really believe in, is that the um, rehabilitation protocol and the routines will be tailored to the individual um, in, in a very precise way. So by measuring talk time and swallowing, you can use those parameters as a condition of the status of, of the patient. And you can um, you know, correlate, correlate changes in those uh, measured characteristics to particular features of the rehabilitation process and, and really refine it uh, with the idea that that will accelerate recovery and improve uh, outcomes. Now, all of this is brand new. I mean, People have not uh, done this in the past. And so that's the hypothesis. I believe in it, uh, but but we'll see how it plays out. I mean, we have devices now on a number of different uh, stroke patients and uh, we're collecting lots of data. One of the uh, additional important aspects of this work is on the data science, like how do you extract detailed information oh, yeah. out of these measurements? And there we work with a, with a team of uh, experts in data analytics at the Ability Lab. So, you know, 20 person team and they develop all kinds of classifiers and uh, computer algorithms that allow us to take the data streams off of our devices, extract meaningful information out of it and provide that information both to the patient and the rehabilitation specialist that's working with them. You're working on a little device that sits on fingernails that helps to measure UV rays with uh 
uh, Dr. June Robinson, who is a world-renowned expert on UV damage. Tell me about that. UV light is one of the most powerful and pre- prevalent uh, carcinogens you know, the, that you come in contact with. And I think skin ca- cancer is the most common cancer you know, that, that people encounter. Um, and, you know, I think that the, the question is, you know, how do you uh, promote safe exposure to the sun and safe practices, right, in, in terms of spending time uh, outdoors? And, and an important component of that is creating quantitative awareness around the extent of UV exposure at any given time. And I think one of the problems is people kind of lose track of how much sun, sun they're uh, getting, right? And um, there have been wearable devices in the past, sort of your know, wrist, ma- uh, you know, wristband that mounted turn devices colors, that, like mood yeah, light, turn colors, like mood light, mood rings, or, or something. You know, yeah. there was a, a Microsoft band type of device that had a, a UV sensor uh, embedded in it. Uh, June Robinson has had a lot of experience with those kinds of devices. The problem is uh, that people will use them, uh, but but then the the consistency around use is quite limited. People will use them for a while and then they'll end up in the drawer and, right. and, and they, they just won't um, you know, take, take advantage of that technology. I think part of it has to do with kind of the bulky form factor, typically a large, larger sort of device, uh, something that's going on your wrist. Maybe you don't want something on your wrist if you're you know, in a business in, meeting or, or aquatic right. activities yeah, or okay. something like that. The other problem is that uh, you have to manage the battery. You know, you have to remember if it's charged or not. And then, you know, the battery gets depleted in the middle of the day and you don't want to you know, have to worry about uh, recharging. So we decided, you know, in addition to thinking about electronic devices with these sort of soft, flexible characteristics w- for integrating on the skin, the other way to think about body integrated device engineering is to make the devices as small as possible. The idea is they get smaller and smaller and lighter in weight. They are less cumbersome and there's less of a hurdle to, to adoption as, as a result. And so what we were able to come up with in this particular case, and which serves as a centroid of NIH-funded uh, studies that we're doing with June, June Robinson right now, is a device platform that's about the size of an M&M candy. I mean, it's a, maybe an eight millimeter di- diameter uh, device. The thickness is comparable to that of a credit card. Uh, the total weight is about 200 milligrams, which is you about the weight of feel a it. Yeah. raindrop roughly. <laughs> okay, you know? right. So, so uh, it's small enough. You can put it on a thumbnail or a fingernail, but you could also mount it on a button on your shirt, for example, a small clip. You could put it on your sunglasses or clip it on your watch band. I mean, there's just a whole variety of different ways that you can deploy this device on, on the body because of its extremely small size. And I think that the key uh, feature of, of the technology is we figured out how to do continuous digital UV sensing in an accumulation mode that does not require a battery. That that's the that's key. the key because yeah. there's none none of that cumbersome charging as exactly. you were talking about. Yeah, you never have to worry your battery's charged or not. It's always on. It's never off. Uh, there are no switches, so the thing uh, device is completely encapsulated in plastic, so it's waterproof. Uh, and the interface to the phone is is wireless using the uh, protocols that were originally installed on the phone for wireless payment. So we're using that same kind of wireless oh, capability, how cool. which is uh, present in all smartphones th- these days. And so. You can think about the device almost as uh, being solar powered in a sense. The UV photons themselves are converted to electrons and then those electrons are stored on a capacitor. And then we use the wireless interface to the phone to measure the accumulated voltage on that capacitor. And with a calibration factor, we can convert that voltage into total cumulative dose uh, of UV that, that's, um, you know, that, that you've received you know, as you're moving around out, outdoors. And so... So it's a pretty interesting uh, class of device. And, um, you know, I think through the um, human uh, subject studies and the field trials that we're doing with with June Robinson, we've also tailored the app to, uh, you know, extract that information, then present it to the user in a way that's most impactful. She has kind of an hourglass way to kind of graphically represent the dose that you received up to a particular point and how much additional UV you can you can uh, tolerate before, before it becomes uh, problematic. So, so it's, it's,
it's it's been a great great interaction, and um, you know we figured out how to manufacture these devices. So we have a, a domestic supply chain and set of manufacturing partners who we can build hundreds of these things and deploy them at a meaningful scale. So we can get statistically relevant information on how you know individuals are using these devices and whether ultimately the most important thing is whether they are changing their behavior uh, right. as a result of this increased awareness. Well, I noticed you're kind of onto something with even customizing some of these devices to look like something someone might really want to wear. Um, this could even pass for nail art or something on someone's fingernails. Some of your other devices look like, they actually look like temporary tattoos with a heart, with a band around it, or even a logo of a company. Um, you have found something there that connects with people that they can kind of express themselves or brands can express themselves. Well, yeah, the, it's it's an interesting point. It's a whole other, you know, aspect, a very important aspect of design. You know, it's not just the engineering aspects, but, you know, what does it look like from an aesthetic standpoint? And what we found is that in most cases, if a device is integrated with the body itself, people are very aware of the appearance. And that can be determinative in terms of whether they will be willing to use the device or, or not. And so, you know, we've we've started to pay attention to that uh, more more and more. Um, you know, for the fingernail devices, we have a, um, a collaboration with L'Oreal. They are, um, you know, in a position to, to launch this technology at a global scale. And we're in the middle of a process of technology transfer to, to allow them to do that. Uh, and so they know everything about fashion fashion and style and beauty. And oh, yes. we've let them take the char- uh, take the lead on adding graphics and colors on, on top of these fingernail UV uh, dosimeters. In some of the uh, skin interface devices, in some cases, we've tried to do the best that, that we can, you know, in terms of our, you know, limited but, but non-zero sense of uh, aesthetics. In the case of the um, sweat collecting uh, devices, there's an interesting opportunity there associated with the ability to um, add colored food dye to the device platforms themselves such that as sweat moves up into the device, it adopts the color of the dye. And depending on the geometry of the channels, you can create almost like um, a time-varying skin tattoo, in a sense, driven by sweat flow. Uh, and so we played around with that a little bit. We tried our, our best to make something that was visually interesting for the first publication that, that we um, you know, had on this uh, technology. It ended up on the cover of the uh, scientific journal Science Translational Medicine. It, it, it turned out that it capped, and that was actually my, my first paper as a Northwestern employee. It came out in uh, November 2016. <laughs> but uh, it captured a lot of um, public attention in, in the broader uh, popular press. And one of the places that that, that um, you know, got interested in it was uh, MoMA, uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. And um, so the museum curators contacted us about featuring our sweat tattoos in MoMA as part of an exhibit that they were doing on fashion uh, and the history of fashion and the future of fashion. And so it was the coolest thing to have our devices in MoMA for a uh, six-month you know, uh, feature uh, display. I'm sure your training as an engineer never prepared you to be a fashion icon. No, it was the most amazing thing. So I have all kinds of <laughs> pictures. There was a display, a little you know, tag. It was like John Rogers, born 1967. That's you know, amazing. American. <laughs> whatever. And so there were 111 items featured in that display. And the title of it was fashion, wait, uh, is is fashion modern, something like this. And um, of the 111, they chose three to be featured in the permanent collection at MoMA. And, and you're our one devices, of them? Yeah. So we're uh, permanently in, in MoMA now. So if people want an up close look, they can head to New York and yeah, check out the yeah, exhibit. It's, wow. it's there. And uh, one of the f- uh, interesting questions that that they ask as, as part of insertion into the permanent collection was whether any of the colors in our devices would fade over a hundred year time scale. I said, I have absolutely we no idea. Yes. We are not engineers. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, you know, kind of the time frame that uh, they want to hold on to it. About, right? Well, so, I feel like we're going to be seeing these devices out in the general public soon. It sounds like there's a lot of interest from Gatorade, L'Oreal. There's companies that want to get this out to consumers. And I think there's an appetite there. The consumers want 
their own data as well. Yeah, right. And we're, we're pretty excited about that uh, as well because I think it's um, you know a kind of commercial pull that can help to drive the technology forward uh, and allow us to add new capabilities and you know allow us to get even more traction on, on the clinical side. So, so Gatorade is interested in the sweat monitoring uh, devices for obvious reasons. They want to uh, you know create an awareness in their customer base around sweat loss and electrolyte loss as mm-hmm. well. So we have the ability to measure chloride concentration in the sweat as it emerges from the skin. 10 years from now, do you think everyone's going to be walking around wearing these devices? I think there's very, very high probability that that's going to happen at, at one level or, or, or another. And so so I think these technologies are, are pretty much on rails in terms of uh, where we believe that they're going to go. Uh, and so we do a lot of work, you know, in, in ensuring that that translation uh, happens effectively. Uh, but then we also have kind of exploratory over the horizon type stuff that, that we work on as well. Uh, a couple of examples uh, would be uh, biodegradable electronics. So we now have complete sets of materials that allow us to build sophisticated electronic devices that are uniquely characterized by the ability to dissolve in water uh, or biofluids to biocompatible end products. And so we can imagine now temporary implants that you can insert into the body. They can be designed to provide a diagnostic or therapeutic function timed to a natural body process. After that body process is completed, then the devices are programmed to essentially dissolve and disappear. So uh, the analogy would be to a resorbable suture. Wow, uh, yeah. You, know, you put the suture in, you really only need it until the wound is healed and closed. The sutures naturally disappear. Now what we're talking about are resorbable electronics that support all kinds of sophisticated function in monitoring, uh, electrical stimulation, drug delivery, and so on. And so as one example, we have devices that um, are configured to implant at sites of a damaged peripheral nerve. They can wirelessly deliver electrical stimulation to the damaged site to accelerate the rates of neuroregeneration and improve the um, the efficacy of the healing process over time. Now, in that kind of uh, circumstance, you don't want the device to be there forever. You just want it to be present while the healing process is ongoing. After the nerve is healed, you don't need the device anymore. You don't want to have to go in and extract it. That would require a secondary surgical operation that could damage the nerve that just healed. So the ideal thing is for that device to be configured to just bioresorb and naturally disappear. So you can almost think about a device like that as an engineered form of a medicine uh, because like a drug, it's only present in the body for a finite amount of time. Unlike a drug, however, it's not going everywhere in the body. You're locating it at the position where its function is relevant. And so our hope is that it will open up new avenues for treating disease and um, accelerating uh, wound healing, but in a way that uh, minimizes side effects because the, the devices are not going randomly everywhere in the body. They're, they're, they're really engineered in a ter- deterministic way at a specific location. So there's a whole set of devices with this kind of bio resorbable feature that we're working on, not just nerve stimulators, bone stimulators, temporary cardiac pacemakers. We have pressure and temperature sensors that go in the intracranial space during a recovery process after a severe traumatic brain injury. Um, We have programmable drug release vehicles, all of which are bioresorbable in that sense. So so there are a couple of other things that we're working on that are kind of out there a little bit. You know, this is not going to be something that's deployed in a year or two like, you know, we hope our our NICU devices will will be. But but we think it it could establish a foundation for additional options, right, in in treating treating patients in, in the future. Read more about John Rogers' work in the upcoming summer 2018 issue of Northwestern Medicine Magazine. 